Hey everybody, this is The Slightest Review. I'm here today to talk to you about another one of R.L. Stein's television shows that I really enjoyed. Well, probably for the first two seasons, or better yet, until the second half of the second season. After that, everything just sucks. And that show is The Haunting Hour. Now this was a spinoff, of somewhat if you would say, from a Cartoon Network movie they made called The Haunting Hour. Don't think about it. And I don't think about it because it's not very good. It's an anthology series. Now, unlike Goosebumps, this series was a lot darker. It was darker in tone. It was darker in music. It didn't have the pairing of, like, say, a boy-girl type, like, um... Uh, partnership where it's like the brother and sister or like best friends it mostly dealt with like a single person also in this series they actually use cuss words twice in like two episodes and also when i say this thing was dark people actually die in this series but it was still meant for kids <laughs> It appeared on the Hub Network, which later got bought out by Discovery Kids. And when Discovery Kids or Discovery Channel bought it, they decided they didn't want to renew this series. Which was good, because in the third and the fourth season, it was garbage. Now the series started to get bad in the second half of the second season. And in three and four, it did not get any better. The reason why it didn't get any better, and the reason why I say it's garbage, is because okay they will set you up on a good premise and the first half of the episode is like really good but then once you get to the ending it falls completely flat and there's no satisfying nature to it and it just wasn't as good as the first season now not every episode of the first season is good there are some real stinkers the weird zombie episode the weird clown episode the weird shark man episode and it just wasn't all that great now, where Goosebumps were based off of R.L. Stein's books, this takes a quite a bit of different turn. See, these was based off of two different book series, where there were 10 short stories in both book series. It's based off the 10 short stories of Chill of the Dead Night, and also 10 short stories of Nightmare Hour. Now, Chills of the Dead Night, they only take one of the short stories and makes it into a TV episode and the rest were never shown. Now, when it comes to the Nightmare Hour, they actually take every 10 um, short stories from that and they turn them into episodes except for one. So they only take nine. All the rest of the Nightmare Hour episodes are completely made up. And then tell you the truth, you know, it, they did a pretty good job making those up, but there is some that are just so bad. And like all of R.L. Stein stuff, it deals with aliens, um, dolls that come to life, mummies, werewolves, vampires, you know, anything you can think of. When I first watched this series in the first season, I was just like, oh my god, this is better than Goosebumps. <laughs> because it was so much darker and eerier and stuff. And the intro is very eerie, very creepy. It's made out of CGI, but it's just, it's ominous, you know what I'm saying? And the music to it. The episodes in the first season are pretty good. Now on DVD wise, only the first season is the only one that came completely out. Now in the second season, only the first half of those episodes came out on DVD. After that, they stopped making a DVD, which sucks because there's one episode I really wanted on DVD and it's not on there. It's the Dreamcatcher episode. Now this show was filmed in Canada just like Goosebumps and it stars a lot of young talent from modern type stuff you'll see. A lot of ABC comedy show kids were on this thing like from Modern Family to, God, what's that thing called? The Goldbergs, um, other young kids that you will see and a lot of Canadian stars too. But there are, like I said in the first season, some episodes that totally suck. Like there's the clown episode. No, it doesn't suck because there's clowns in it. No, I'm not scared of clowns like some people are. I never understood that. I don't understand why people are scared of clowns. Anyway, it's a boy. He's scared of clowns. Then it turns out he morphs into one. And it turns out his whole family it are clowns. Weird episode. There's another one where... There's a boy, he's scared of going into the water, he doesn't want to go into the pool, he sees a shark in the pool, 
And then he's scared of sharks. Turns out that it was his dad. And turns out he's a shark too. When they get into the water, they turn into sharks. And he ends up eating a boy that bullied him. Yeah. <laughs> the zombie episode was just bizarre. It's about this guy who's really good at playing video games. And he gets told to like come to this place where he can play this thing called Z-Town. He brings his friends against the rules. When he plays the game, both of them get sucked into the video game. And then they fight off zombies in a very comedic kind of way. Then the only good thing about this is the twist ending. In order to escape the video game, you have to lure somebody into the video game. And that's what he does. And the boy gets yanked into the TV. And it is freaky. Now, the red dress is one of my all-time favorite episodes of this series. And it stars an actress I really, really like. And so basically it's like this, there's an attractive girl who has a geeky exterior to it. She wears like glasses. She has like hand-me-down clothes. She has holes in her clothes, but she has a bunch of patches. She's a poor girl and she works at like this thing for summer. And you know, she's tired of being poor. She's tired of not being looked at. She likes this one boy. Her friend tells her, you know, it's just the way life is. They got the good end of the stick and we got the short end, you know? But she ends up seeing this guy and she really likes him but can't have him they both end up her and her best friend and i'm going to like a pawn shop where she sees this red dress but it's cost way more than she can afford and so she ends up stealing it and then the shopkeeper lady who's blind tells her everybody's gonna pay everybody has a price stuff like that so when still in this dress she puts it on she has now confidence in herself she asked the boy out on a date but then some strange freaky stuff started happening. She starts hearing this tapping. It's the blind lady in her little walking cane, constantly tap, 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 tap. And she's constantly following this girl in the middle of the night and everything else. And it freaks this girl out so bad. Anyways, this little prom thing they're having, she still didn't get a dress back even though her friend told her to. And while she's there with the guy she likes, she starts seeing like, you know, the creepy, um shopkeeper lady but her face is totally like zombified it freaks her out she runs back home and then she hears that tap 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 noise again and it's that woman and it's the middle of the night and the lady's falling all inside her house and up the stairs and she pleads and begs like she doesn't see the woman she but she just pleads and begs telling her to please leave her alone she'll return the dress she didn't mean no harm and then you see her get snatched through the door she wakes up and she can't see nothing like she's all like why can't i see anything she goes into the mirror she is completely blind her eyes have been snatched from her body or her head and then we see the shopkeeper pawn lady and next thing you know the blind lady now has eyes and can see and she now has the girl's glasses she stole the girl's eyes you would never see that in goosebumps ghostly stare is another great one with an actress i really admire a lot and so it's basically it's a girl who likes to go to the grave and she likes to um do the rubbings of like the graves and stuff so she brings her little brother they love having a staring contest is where she always wins the boy is wandering off getting on her nerves he falls into like an empty grave and then as you know he comes out and he has to go home and then when he talks to her his voice has changed and he's acting weird he's talking about how cold he is you can literally see the breath come out of him and when she has a staring contest with him his face turns into like a skeleton she freaks out she's like who are you and she turn, it turns out he is a now a ghost a ghost has possessed his body from the grave site turns out when you fall into a grave you kind of get kind of like the ghost takes your physical form and leaves but your body is still in the um grave it's kind of weird anyways anyway she tells him give um give her brother back he's all like why you hate him and everything so then she's like i'm gonna get my brother back so she goes back to the grave site she's looking there all night and she is greeted by a bunch of ghosts floating around the grave site and it, they're like trying to trick her into going into like their grave and one of them is a nurse and she's literally trying to trick her into going in her grave so she can like live through her body because if you don't get your body back before sunrise you stay a um ghost yourself and the, and the ghost takes over your body so she falls into that lady grave, but then, then she gets out and then the lady's like, oh, I'm sorry. The nurse lady's like, you know, I should never done that, blah, blah, blah. So then she keeps searching for the boy and she, and the boy is trying to crawl out the grave because he's still alive and stuff. 
So they're calling out for each other's names, but then she falls into like a grave herself. The boy crawls himself out, but then the girl comes back. She's all like, let's get out of here. Then when they back at the house, she's taking tons of showers because she is cold. They have a staring contest. Ghosts don't like being stared at. That what freaks them out. And their face turns into a skeleton. And then she talks about like, oh, it must have been like a chill came over her because she's so cold. And it's such a freaky episode. Really, you deals with a bratty little girl and she wants a life-size doll and these life-size doll literally look like you. They, they model them after like a picture. So in a way, she loves the doll to death, but then something strange happens. Her mom starts to love the doll even more and starts to sleep with the doll. And then she won't let the little girl have her doll. This pisses the girl off. Next thing you know, the little girl starts to act a little weird. She's acting drained. She's acting tired. Her face is turning pale. Something is really odd going on with her. She starts to see like a lot of bad stuff starting to happen around the house. It gets blamed on the little girl. The little girl's like, it wasn't me. It was the doll. The doll's alive. And then so the brother, he's all like, you know, you're lying. She's like, I'm not lying. So he's like, all right, I'm going to try to figure out what's going on. And then so he goes to like the shop where like, you know, the dolls were made and the lady tells him that these dolls are all alive, but they're all good dolls, except for one. There's one doll that's not happy with being a doll. It wants to be a little girl. Next thing you know, like the little girl starts to slowly turn into a doll herself because her doll is taking over her life essence. And then one day she walks into the room. She tells her, um, the doll, like, you know, can we see the doll move at times and stuff like that? And she tells the doll, like, you know, so you're not going to take on my body, blah, blah, stuff like that. The doll has a hammer in her hand and she smashes the glass um, mirror. Next thing you know, the little girl comes out the room and she's acting completely different. Why? Because she has been possessed now by the doll and then the little girl is in the doll's body and stuff. And so the little girl starts telling the little um, her brother, like, you know, you know, um, maybe it's not me that's acting weird. Maybe it's you. And she has a knife in her hand and she's slowly rubbing it against like the kitchen table and stuff. And then she stabs the kitchen table. This is some freaky stuff for like a little kid show. This would never happen in Goosebumps. All in all, the boy, and then she decides to throw the doll away. And so the boy figures out, oh, what happened and stuff. So he gets the doll back. And then as the girl is trying to run away, she slowly turns back into the doll and stuff. And everything is saved. And then the doll reappears in a later episode in season two. Dead Body is one of the coolest episodes I've ever seen in this show. So it deals with a boy. He's constantly getting picked on by like these two bullies. He likes this one girl and he wants to ask her out. But his friend tells him like, look, dude, we're the video game playing type of people who like stays in basements all weekend playing video games this is the type of girl who parties you have no chance with her but he's still gonna try to get this girl well on the class trip in the woods the two bullies are picking on him and they embarrass him and stuff and then all of a sudden he meets this boy in the woods and the boys are like hey you want to get revenge on those guys he's like sure but they'll beat me up he's like don't worry i'll take care of it and so the boy he freaks the two um, bully dudes, that uh, one of the bully dudes to the point where he is petrified. And so, you know, he, he meets the boy again at school and the boy's all like, hey, did you like what I do to that one dude? He's like, yeah, but the bully guy is so traumatized, he transfers school. And so he's all like, well, you know, I have to get the other bully too. He's all like, yeah, but just don't do nothing too harsh to him. He's like, oh, don't worry, you know, I'm, I'm going to get some revenge for you. So the next thing you know, he his face morphs into like a monster and he scares the piss <laughs> out the other bully dude. And so he leaves school and everything. And so the one boy, he's like walking around school and he's telling like the girl, the dude's name that he met in the woods. And the gender dudes are like, why are you talking about a dead boy for? And he's all like, what are you talking about? He's like, that boy you just mentioned, he died at a school dance many years ago in the gym because a bunch of kids were picking on him and they sell fireworks and the fireworks end up setting the gym on fire and killed the little boy. So the day of the prom, he asked the girl out, the girl said, yeah. And then so the dance thing, um, he's looking now for the ghost dude and the ghost dude's all like, you know, man, look, 
you know, I saved you. I did what I was supposed to do and you owe me because he wanted a favor for a favor. Next thing you know, something falls on the boy or something like that. And then he's sent back in time to like the 1950s when the other boy died. He rescues the boy from dying. So then he's all like, well, who the curse has been lifted off you. I've saved you. And the ghost boy just gives him an evil look. And he traps him in like the room and it's getting set on fire. And then that's, you know, the boy wakes up. And so when the boy is going to the dance and everything, he's back in his time and he's trying to like talk to people. Nobody can see him. And then his hand passes through like the girl or something like that. He is now a ghost himself. And the ghost boy is now living again. And yeah, that's a crazy twist. Now this does get um, brought back up a couple of seasons later and stuff. Wrong number stares um debbie ryan and it's one of her she was still on disney channel doing stuff at that time but she moved on over to do something a little bit different and it's, it's pretty dark not too dark but pretty dark so anyway she's a bratty little popular girl who likes to dress like naughty and stuff like that and she's always pranking people phone call wise especially the lady next door and she makes it to where the lady is so unbearable to where the lady ends up dying and so after that she's constantly picking on this one girl but then all of a sudden her cell phone keeps ringing and it's the dead lady who keeps calling her cell phone it freaks her out so then the girl who gets picked on at school tells her you know i can help my uncle does like voodoo stuff like that he can help you so her and her friend um they are constantly getting harassed by the dead woman they do the voodoo ritual the voodoo ritual backfires and makes the dead woman comes more like alive and starts haunting them and stuff. And then she traps the bully girl who is Debbie Ryan in the cell phone. It turns out that the girl getting picked on, they set all this up because the grandmother is the one who died and who's been harassing them on the phone. <laughs> Brush with Madness is a scary episode. It's okay when it comes to the haunting hour. No, 10 short stories, the ones that they didn't make onto the show, they just reworked them so they're loosely adapted. And Brush with Madness, there's a boy, a comic book fan, and he loves this one comic book artist so much that he goes to get an autograph, but he kind of does the obsessive fan thing and freaks this dude out. He leaves his paintbrushes behind. The boy is going to return them, but he decides not to. The paintbrushes possesses the boy to start painting. And he's painting this man in a trench coat and fedora. And, this, and then the events that he keeps painting with this man are real life events that are about to take fruition. The man is chasing down or staring at his house. The man is chasing down his best friend. The man is trying to kill his best friend. The man kidnaps his best friend. And the girls all like, stop painting this crap, man. It's freaky. And this stuff keeps happening and stuff. And he's like, I can't stop for some reason. I just got to keep painting. And he gets to a point where he just starts painting on the walls of his room. Like he is possessed. His friend gets kidnapped. He goes to like the house in his painting. And he finally confronts the man. It's him. Her, his friends are like, why are you doing this? When he takes off his hat, it turns out he is the, 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 the hooded figure man or whatever. And then the dude has like a giant chainsaw type thing. He's going to like kill both the guy and the girl. It turns out that it is the um, comic book artist dude. He is taking the paintbrushes and he is possessing that boy. And he is the one causing all these events to happen because he doesn't like conventions. He doesn't like having fans. He is going to kill his fans. So his fans will leave him alone and they end up dying off screen. You will never see this on Goosebumps. Catching cold was freaky, man. Like, so there's like, this overweight kid and he has a friend and then he, they, um, he eats some ice cream. No, 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 no. Yeah. He finds this ice cream truck dude and they give some ice cream and it's like the best ice cream he's ever had. He can't imagine eating any other kind of ice cream. And when he does try to eat any other ice cream, he doesn't like it. He only wants this creamy cold kind. And so it's like, he tells his friend, he's totally obsessed with it. His friends are like, you know, you need to kick the habit. He's like, no man, you're just jealous. Cause you've never had this ice cream. And so he's constantly trying to, and then the ice cream truck is 
always driving around his house at night making him want more ice cream so then he gets to the point where he's gonna try to hunt down the ice cream truck dude and he uses his dad who's a cop his um um, spike strip thing he stops the um truck because he could never catch it before it was always too fast and stuff and going around corners and disappearing but anyways there's a legend of this kid who constantly kept chasing the ice cream truck too and this kid never been seen from again so when he goes to the ice cream truck when he finally catches up with it he goes inside and there's a giant overweight man with a beard with ice cream all over his body and he's like it's you it's that boy who disappeared all them years ago he's like yeah it is me he always tried to chase the ice cream truck and finally did and could never leave it because the truck is alive and the truck needs a soul he tricked this boy into liking his ice cream finding the truck so that the boy can be the new driver of the truck and then so the older man leaves and the boy is trapped inside the truck he can't leave now and the truck you know it just drives on off by itself it's just a freaky episode scary mary is cool scary mary is based off of bloody mary and so it's this girl she's very attractive but she don't think she is and she's with her friends they have like a slumber party and she says like scary mary three times and she's supposed to appear and so her friends constantly pick on her and all this other because she's scared of everything. When she does say scary Mary three times, Mary ends up showing up in her mirror. And so basically what it is, is that Mary and um, the girls are acting kind of weird and stuff. And she has this brush. The brush came out of the mirror and it has a giant M on it for Mary. She brushes her hair with it and she starts to act different. Very, very, very weird. She now thinks she's so attractive. She now thinks she's the most beautiful woman in the world. And like her friends are like, you're acting kind of weird. I don't like you like this. And they're like, she's just jealous. So then she goes back in her room. And then next thing you know, there are like all these faces in the mirror wearing a mask. They grab her and they yank her into the mirror. They gag her and everything. She wakes up with this weird Victorian dress on. And she's in this abandoned house. She's now in this mirror world where Mary lives at Mary's world. And it's just on this lakeside like building and stuff. And, and it's just like completely freaky. And then there's a girl who comes into the room with a mask on her face. Um, the mask is like just a straightforward like blank face. It's white. Like have you ever seen the Court of Owls from Batman? They look kind of like that. And so she tells the girl, why are you wearing this mask? And she's all like, it's time for you to pick out your mask. And she's like, I don't want to wear a mask. So she rips the mask off the girl's face. The girl's face is completely like bare erased. All you see is it's like it's been burnt, cinched off. And all you see is like the healed skin. Like it, it's freaky and stuff. So it turns out like this. Mary was burnt in a fire. She's always looking for a man who's going to fall in love with her because her face is so hideous now. So she steals these little girls from the mirrors and she keeps them in her world. And when she takes, she rips their face off, they have to wear these masks because they no longer have a face. The only way you can be rescued if a guy comes to rescue you, like a lover type thing. So, um, this guy who does have a crush on this girl, Hannah, I think, no, I, I, I think that's her name. Um... So he goes to rescue her and you know, the lake I told you about, is not water, it's tears. Every time Mary cries, it fills up like a tired, like bucket full of tears and they pour it in the thing. And that's the only way to escape that world. It's like a lake of fire type thing. And so he rescues her. He sets on um, the building, gets set on fire. Um, Mary's playing her piano, talking about nobody wants you because you have an ugly face, blah, 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 stuff like that. Then it turns out that Mary somehow escaped that realm and now she wants the boy. And it ends like that with her trying to like grab him and stuff. It's a really cool and freaky episode. Dreamcatcher is the freakiest of all the episodes. Basically it's this. It's the kids who go to summer camp, a bunch of girls. And there's this one girl who used to be friends with this other girl. But then the other girl started being friends with this other girl and it made her jealous. So, the whole time they're there, the mean girl is now just being mean to everybody and just ruining stuff for them. And they tell the legend of like this dream catcher type spider man looking thing. 
and how like he only enters your dreams so if you can manage to stay awake he will not harm you and the only thing that can help prevent you from um dying is like this a dream catcher like a native american dream catcher so the girl she ends up ruining their um dream catcher so they can have nightmares and they do have nightmares the girl get revenge and they ruin her dream catcher thing anyways as they're trying their best to stay awake they are unable to now the mean girl decided she doesn't want to be around them so she's gonna go sleep in the cafeteria so in a way the girls are trying their best to stay awake they fall asleep and next thing you know the little spider dude is like after them and captures one of them and then the other girl shows up because she fell asleep too so anyways she decided okay i'm gonna be nice i'm gonna help you find this other girl so they go looking for him and they're in the cave and the cave has spider webs galore and they find the girl and so the other girl tries to help her but she falls down and gets stuck she tells the mean girl help us she's like nope she's all like this is what you get for um ditching me and all this other stuff but then she slips and falls into the net of webs herself so the spider creature dude he's coming in there and he is like a freaky looking thing like this is some good like um prosthetics and he's going there to get the girls but then two of them start to fade away because they starting to wake up because the alarm is waking them up and the girls are all like well i'll be safe too because i'm gonna wake up and they're like no you can't because you're in the kitchen because you didn't want to sleep next to us and then so the girls are all like i'm awake i'm awake and the spider dude's all like if you was awake then you wouldn't be here right now and then the girl like screams because he's like he's about to devour her and stuff it is a freaky episode there's a really freaky bug episode about this kid named Norman. He's in the classroom. He's learning about bugs and he's constantly getting picked on by this one guy. In a way, the assignment is to collect a bunch of bugs. And as Norman is doing that, he encounters a praying mantis that is spying on him. And so he picks it up and they instantly bond. Somehow the mantis has not kind of like um telepathic ability to him and they have a really close bond right anyways so at school the dude's getting picked on again he's getting his head flushed in the toilet and he hates how all these bigger kids are picking on him he's able to bond with his praying mantis who he renamed manny because you know he's a little guy and he doesn't let nobody pick him or uh, boss him around Anyway, at some point in time, he realizes that through Manny, he has the ability to control bugs. Well, he decides he wants a little sweet revenge. And so the next day in school, he got a spring in his step. And so, like, he orders his bugs to attack his bully while he's on the toilet. And then he forces his bully to give him himself a wedgie. After that day, he has like corrupted power. Everybody in school kind of fears him now. And but the bad thing is now that he's conquered his bully and stuff, he feels he doesn't need Manny or any other bug help. So he squishes a bug to make a point to um his bully. Well, this pisses off Manny to the point where he confronts him at night. And he mouths off to Manny talking about, I don't need you and blah, 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 stuff like that. But then he realizes he has bugs in his room. So he gets rid of them and flushes them. And he tries to tape up every area of his house that they can like crawl into. Well, he forgets to tape up one part. And in the middle of the night, they consume his body. And he is freaking out as Manny is like standing over him dominant as the true boss. <laughs> It's a really neat episode that's kind of like a throwback to 1950s like horror movies and stuff. Like there's this one dude named John and he loves old school horror monster movies. And he's supposed to have like a movie night with his best friend down in his basement. Well, his best friend decides to bring a movie date because he wants to get him some. <laughs> This pisses off John and the girls are all like, hey, instead of watching movies, let's go down to the beach and go down to this beach party. So they all go. And as they at the stoplight, they notice that this like abandoned like movie theater, drive-in theater, appeared out of nowhere. This catches John's interest where he gets out the car and runs inside. 
The other two are annoyed and they chase after him, but then they realize he's nowhere to be found. Then they turn around, he's inside the horror movie. So they don't know how he got in there, he doesn't know. But while in the horror movie, he starts to flirt and have a crush on like the scientist's um, daughter. Well, the other mad scientist comes in and uh, takes him hostage and injects him with some kind of like serum that's supposed to turn him into a teenage tick. <laughs> I said this is old school horror movies, right? <laughs> well, they find a way to get him out. I think they like cut the film or something like that. And so he comes out. But oh, wait, wait, wait. Before he comes out, a cop showed up and he started snooping around because he noticed that this driving theater popped out of nowhere too. Then he's in the movie. Anyway, so the um, the little birds, they get both John and the cop out. Then the next day, um, his friend is calling him on the phone and he's all like, you know, that cop that like out the movie, he doesn't have any memory of him being in the movie and stuff, but yet John does. Then John starts to realize he's starting to act kind of weird. He no longer has like a taste for human food. Instead, he now has a taste for flesh and blood. Oh yeah. <laughs> he's sniffing the dog and everything. So then he starts to like, when his when he doesn't answer his phone, uh, the lovebirds are like looking for him, but they can't find him. He is slowly transforming into a tick, and it is gruesome to watch on like TV with his fingernail is like falling off and everything. Like it, ugh, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, he transforms into a tick. He terrorizes this little girl in the town. His friend is trying to find him, so they go down to the hardware store to pick up some supplies. They find him somehow, tie him up, and they, they bring him back inside the movie somehow. And then um, the scientist dude's daughter, she gets kidnapped by the mad scientist. But then they all get kidnapped by the mad scientist. The mad scientist, who's a teenager by the way, is pointing the cop's gun all up in their faces. This has never happened on Goosebumps. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so then, you know... Um, John, who's turned into a tick, there's another tick in there too. Um, from the girl, the, the, the scientist's daughter's ex boyfriend, or something like that. So the two ticks fight out, uh, and then the kids end up escaping. They subdue the mad scientist, and then they leave the movie, um, well, movie thing. But John is nowhere to be found. He decides he's gonna stay in the movie. Why? Because he feels like, you know what, the real world just isn't for him. And as a geek that he is, that loves old school horror movies, that's what he needs to be. Plus, he fell in love with the scientist's daughter's girl. So, you know. And it's just like a wacky, like, creepy episode. And I really enjoy it. Like, it's a little hokey and everything, but it's fine because, you know, the comedy balances out, like, the creepiness and stuff. Alrighty, well, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.